uh, here at B-Side San Antonio. I, this is our, my third time here for B-Side San Antonio. My name is Kathleen Smith. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for two companies, one ClearJobs.net and the other CybersecJobs.com. I'm on the planning committee for nine different B-Sides and I'm also on the senior staff for B-Sides Las Vegas for uh, the large conference that happens during mm -hmm. Hacker Summer Camp. I actually run the two-day career track that also has career fair, but also sessions, career mentoring, and resumes. So I might know something about recruiters working in this community, but one thing that I've learned is that there is this huge misconception about recruiters in the community. So one thing that I've done for as many B-sides as I can possibly do is find a local group of recruiters who I know are doing a really great job and introduce them to the community so that people understand that all of those memes you see about recruiters, like this one, are not really true. That there are different levels, different kinds of recruiters out there. And one of the best things that you can do for your career is to develop a relationship with five or seven recruiters who truly resonate with you, who understand who you are. You may have had an interview with a really great recruiter, may not have gotten the job, but you have been able to say, I really like talking to that recruiter. And you'll want to keep up to date with them, keep in touch with them, and say, yes, this is the, uh, a recruiter that can help me in my overall career. So we're sort of going to go over some of the myths and misconceptions that happen between a recruiter and a candidate and also open this up for some questions. So I'm actually going to have each one of our panelists introduce themselves, introduce what, uh, how long they've been in recruiting, what kind of recruiting that they do, and maybe something not everyone knows about them. So Irma? Hi, uh, my name is Irma Simons and I work for a company called IP Secure here in San Antonio. A small company, about 175 employees. Uh, we're a government contractor. We do a lot of work for the Department of Defense, um, primarily supporting the Air Force and the intelligence community. Uh, I have been doing human resources for about 20, over 20 years is how I'm going to keep it. Um, and I've pretty much been in a generalist role where I do a little bit of everything. Recruiting has been one of the functions in my job as an HR manager, uh, but I do have other job duties and responsibilities. But uh, recruiting is one that occupies a lot of my, a lot of my time and, and a lot of my efforts. So I'm glad to be here. And this is Irma's second time she was here uh, with us last year. Bill Brandstetter is also, um, this is his third time here at B-Site San Antonio. We met uh, three years ago when he came out and did resume reviewing. So Bill is also doing resume reviewing for us over in conference room C. And you'll also be doing resume reviewing at the Cyber Texas event mm -hmm. in August. So mm -hmm. Bill, tell us a little bit more about you. So I've been recruiting for about 13 years. Uh, I work for a company called Abacus Solutions Group. And we're about 140 employees. Uh, we do mostly Homeland Security, probably 60% Homeland Security, 30% DOD, and various other agencies, uh, the other part. Um, they make me do other things just because we're a small uh, company, so I've, I've been a facility security officer, so I can talk to talk about security clearances. Um, they make me do some HR. I don't really like that. I just like recruiting. Um, what else am I saying? And what does someone not know about you? Uh, in two weeks, so I've, I got a full life outside of recruiting. In two weeks, my wife and I are going to uh, the border of Rwanda and Congo to meet with a bunch of church leaders to put on a conference about trauma, uh, just because they're still recovering from the genocide. So, I'm excited about that. Awesome. Excellent. Awesome. KJ. So, I'm KJ Howell, and I am with Abacus Technology Corporation. So, um, different company different company. Um, we're actually um, located uh, corporate out of DC, um, but I have been with a company about a year doing recruiting. In fact, it's kind of my anniversary right about now. Um, but I have been in the San Antonio area for over 25 years, so I've been entrenched in the local community. In fact, that's one of the reasons that I was brought on, was to have that local networking um, capability 
So I've been in the business community for over 25 years, and I've actually worked with a, another local DOD contracting company. Um, so Abacus uh, Technology Corporation, we um, here locally, we perform um, for the Air Force customer specifically, and so I specifically recruit for San Antonio. Um, but I have a sales and marketing background, so that serves me very well. Um, but uh, we perform um, engineering, IT, logistics here locally. Um, and um, we do have um, engineering IT services throughout the, the U.S. through Abacus Technology Corporation. And what does someone not know about you? Um, I'm actually a former uh, cast member for the Walt Disney Company. Awesome. awesome. So, um, <laughs> what yes. character? Uh, well, I actually worked as an account executive for Radio Disney AM 1160 here in San Antonio. So um, part of my background is marketing and sales, and so I bring a lot of that to the table here in San Antonio. So I do produce um, the local marketing on my social media, and so that also helps me as I'm networking. And so a lot of those skills and assets I, I bring to the table as well. So we have recruiters who are in different roles in their company, and that is one thing that you need to understand when you're talking to someone who reaches out to you as far as a potential job, is that they may have other things that they do. They may not just be a tech recruiter. They actually might be a, re tech, a recruiter for a variety of different jobs. Or they may be like Irma, recruiting and HR. So Irma, tell us what a typical day is like for you. Well, every day is not the same. Um, when it comes to the recruiting aspect, recruiting is very fluid and dynamic. So we have opportunities that become available um, whether it's something that you're working on for a bid and proposal and you're being asked to start getting ready to build a pipeline of candidates for when a contract is awarded to, hey, we've been waiting six months for this contract to be awarded. It was just awarded today. Let's move forward with hiring 20 people. Um, a, a lot of my time is also spent just talking to people. Um, you know, the, all the other, you know, administrative clerical stuff that I do from an HR standpoint, um, you know, that kind of sometimes has to take the back burner because you, you spend a lot of time investing and talking to people and getting to know them and what it is that they're looking for and seeing if you have a good match. So, Bill, your typical day, you're just, you're, you know, sitting in a hammock and you know the right I work from home so yeah. I'm in my well, well, yeah, shorts. Maybe, maybe you are in your PJs but you know a lot of times when I talk to job seekers they think oh you know a recruiter's life is eight to five they only have to fill one or two jobs and they get this big fat paycheck I think it's a little different what's it like for you yeah I'm, I'm still waiting on the fat paycheck but um, <laughs> Probably it's, if I'm not interviewing candidates for positions, it's the other, I could classify the other part as moving the ball forward. So um, checking in on candidates that I sent to a hiring manager. Hey, did you have the interview? How did it go? Checking with the hiring manager. What did you think of so-and-so? Um, if we're processing a clearance, hey, did you finish your equip? Did you go get your fingerprints? Checking in and make sure that they're moving forward or or just see all the administrative things that that go into it like answering their questions all the emails that come in the phone calls the text updating our reports because we have to do a lot of reporting and tracking metrics um, so that's how I split my day KJ your typical day um, well my husband gets up early and then so I'm usually up by seven because my guys um, I work remotely from home as well so I um, get up early. My guys, we don't, ha I, we, we don't have a local office here. So um, I'm up at seven. My guys usually are up at six out at, at the customer site. And so I do work in my PJs a lot. Um, and um, I'm there on the laptop and I'm following up. First thing I do is go to my um, company career site platform and I'm looking at all of the new uh, resumes so I can start vetting those. But we have a very much team approach um, uh, the way that we vet. And so I'm doing things hand in hand with my team, my team leads and my hiring manager. So I'm always reviewing things initially and that's usually how I start my day. I'm, I'm previewing the resumes so I know how to start my day so what I've got to, to kick over to my guys. So there are many different steps 
to the interviewing process, to the recruiting process, to the hiring process. And what, what's interesting is there are a lot of places where people drop the ball or they mess it up. So Bill, I'm going to have you start out. What are some or one or three places that job seekers tend to mess up the process and they don't even know that they're messing up the process? Um, I, I'd have to say communication with me is, is a big thing. So if, if I've set forth expectations of, hey, I need you to go and do this by this date and they, they don't do it or they, they do it and they don't circle back with me and let me know, it slows down the process. And I, I'm sure it's the same thing for you guys. We've got to get the positions filled as quickly as possible because we've got people that are checking in with us saying, Hey, where are these candidates? Where are they at? When are they going to start? Um, I've got performance metrics I have to hit where I have to have people start within a certain period of time or else I get in trouble. So I'm constantly on these candidates. Hey, where are you at? Are you moving? So when I don't hear from a candidate for a while and they're not checking in with me, that really hurts them. And because of that, I typically will have multiple candidates going through a process and whoever's first, they're going to get the job. So there's candidates that won't get the job because they didn't hustle through the process and communicate with me, and I decided to go with someone else. Erno, what's one mistake that it's, people make? It's very close to what Bill mentioned. Um, for us, we have a two-part application process. So if we've reviewed your resume and a manager has expressed an interest in wanting to meet with you, the next step is launching the second part of the employment application. So generally, we ask. Uh, candidates to you know complete that before they come in for their interview um, sometimes the applications don't get completed before they show up and we try to schedule interviews believe it or not you know with ample notice because we understand that a lot of individuals are currently employed they kind of need to make arrangements um, but uh, you know not completing a second half of an employment application I think is a little bit um, telling of of your of the candidate that you're dealing with, um, so I would say it has to do with communication and just not following through with certain basic requests. And nowadays, you know, applicant tracking systems, um, you know, there's all types out there, but for the most part, um, I know ours. If if when you upload your resume, the applicant tracking system is going to populate a lot of the fields for you to make the application process even easier. Um, and you don't spend too much time, you know, investing too much time in that. And I think sometimes applicants, they're a little apprehensive about maybe investing what they think is going to be an hour of their time completing an application online when that's no longer really the case when you have a robust, you know, applicant tracking system. It'll, it'll take a lot less time than you think. Sounds like you have a really good applicant <coughs> tracking system. I mean, uh, an applicant tracking system in ATS is you'll upload your resume, but you also have an application to fill out, which some of them will ask for the exact same information that's on your resume. This is not to create a hurdle for you. It is to gather information in specific data sets so that the company can evaluate where they're getting their candidates from. What kind of experience are they getting? Should they be recruiting at one particular school or not? But there is not one ATS fits all. There are several of them out there. So, you know, if it's for Irma's company, it sounds like it's going to be easy. Other companies, it may be a long process, and you just have to be prepared for that. KJ, what's one place that you see job seekers really mess up the process? Well, our system's, you know, fairly easy. You just upload your resume. We don't, we don't have anything that scrubs for words or, mm -hmm. or anything like that. So you just upload it, and, and, and we review it. So. Um, Probably my, my biggest pet peeve is when, when you get through the process and, and you're, you're, we're ready to interview you, I, ha I have a very simple request of, um, I ask for you to choose two times to come in because I'm trying to um, uh, schedule you against my hiring manager's schedule and I, I request two times and I give you all these time slots and all I ask her, choose two times and I, I don't know why but uh, it always comes back uh, they give me one time slot and I've asked for two because I'm and I'm juggling all these so so when when a hiring manager or you have an option and they please follow the instructions there's a reason they're asking for something so it's just 
because I'm asking for two slots for a reason because I'm juggling all of these schedules and it's quite frustrating when I'm only getting one slot back and so if I can make it fit with one slot but there's never a, you know sometimes they'll say well I can you know they've got a very tight schedule themselves and I appreciate that when they when they give me a reason but there's you know people don't think ahead so that's really my biggest struggle is not following not anticipating those what well, there's that? reasons yeah. why, and when I give you 12 time slots and you come back with one, I just think, you know, please be a little flexible. And these are like a week out, so, you know, it's, that's my biggest struggle is people not following that type of a, of a question. Some of the other areas where people have sort of messed up the process and they don't understand is the technical interviews or the phone screens. So, you know, this is your first opportunity to talk to a recruiter or talk to the company. Understand that's the first impression that they're going to have for you. If it is not a really good time to take that call, ask to reschedule for a time when you can take that call. It's not when you're at a soccer game for your kids or when you're, you know, in the middle of some kind of other work meeting. Please just ask to reschedule that. And if you're going to be taking a technical interview, it might be helpful to sort of brush up on some of the skills that they're going to test you on. Because I can't tell you how many times recruiters have told me that they've gone, they've had a technical interview, and they can hear the person typing on the other end. What is the answer to this? If you don't know the answer, just say it. You know, they're going to hear that pause, looking, looking, oh, it's this. No, don't do that. It's a technical interview. Brush up on it if you haven't, you know, you may have used it eight, nine years ago. Maybe go back, you know, run through a few tests. So that would be great. Oops. Um, what's interesting is a lot of people get mad at recruiters. They say, I didn't get a job because of the recruiter. But they don't understand that this is a multi stage process. As you heard KJ saying, you know, we're, we're trying to schedule different tests. So just a quick question, in each one of your companies, how many decision makers are there in actually bringing on a candidate? Irma? Um, for me, it really depends on the contract that um, the candidate is being interviewed against. Uh, generally, it's a minimum of two, sometimes three. Often, it's two. Mm -hmm. Bill? Same, same. KJ? Um, one to two. Mm -hmm. So it's the recruiter who's going to be doing sort of the um, initial screening. Then there's the hiring manager. And if it is a client-facing contract, so you, know, you have a lot of client-facing contracts within the government contracting community. But as we heard in the previous presentation with Rapid7, they have a lot of external con uh, customers. They have a lot of other consulting that they do. So you're going to go through three or four different interviews to actually get to that final, hey, am I going to work here? Now, one thing that um, I'm just going to throw a question that I don't have on here, or maybe I do. If someone doesn't fit and you say that they don't fit, what do you expect the, the candidate to do? Do you expect them to flame you, or should they check back with you? I mean, you know, there's sometimes there's not a good fit for one job, mm -hmm. but what about others? Comments, Bill? I think it depends on, on how well I like the person. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, if they're not a fit because they just are not someone that we would ever want to hire, um, I might give them a, a different answer, but you know, we can't hire everyone that we like for a single position. So I would sincerely thank the person for applying and I'd say, please keep an eye on our career site. Uh, we want to try and get you on the team down the road as soon as we get another opportunity. Um, and I, I may call you back as soon as I can to get you on the team a different way. Um, I agree. It depends on the, the candidate um, as well. Um, you know, we have people that come in and multiple candidates that come in and interview for and are competing for one job. Uh, sometimes it's a tough call that these managers have to, to make sometimes. Um, and I think that if you establish, you know, a rapport with that recruiter, what may not have worked out this time around, again, because recruiting is so fluid and dynamic and positions open and close almost on a daily basis, it seems like, 
Uh, what may not be a fit could be a fit tomorrow, and at least That's we've right. kind of established uh, a relationship already, a rapport, there's a file, there's a record, so that when that one position does become available, you'll say, okay, I remember you know, the, this candidate that we interviewed, this is gonna be a good fit for this new rec that opened. Um, if it's an individual that I think maybe either, you know, the skill set just wasn't a fit and I don't see it being a fit for the organization, for example, um, it could be that, you know, a lot of the jobs that we hire for require top secret SCI clearances. And I'm dealing with a candidate that may not have that and you know that those aren't easy to come by and they don't, uh, they're not granted from one day to the next. Um, what you do is try to help, at least personally, I try to help them network with other companies or recommend other companies that they may want to follow up with um, or check out those career sites um, to help them in their, in their career. Um, our philosophy at IP Secure is just trying to help people, um, whether it's an opportunity with us or somewhere else, just trying to pay it forward and, and help them kind of accomplish those goals, so refer them to, to someone else that could use their skill set. KJ, how about people who aren't a fit but may be fit later or not a fit later? Um, we're very much the same uh, philosophy as, as Irma at Abacus Technology. Um, and any candidate that I meet, um, I invite them to connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, there's, there's a lot of business opportunity here in San Antonio. And so, and I work with a lot of transitioning military, so I start with them as, as they're starting their job search. So um, we have the conversation initially that um, we, 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 we are growing at, at, at Abacus um, with, with our programs. And we started out with 60 and we're now at over 120 um, positions and we're growing and the programs are growing with the customer. So um, as we grow, we do realize, you know, we, we're not going to be able to hire everyone that we bring on board. But as we, we do find the right fit, and, um, and as you say, you know, uh, our, our, all of our positions have to have clearances. So as we do come across those, quali those quality candidates, um, if we don't have something today, we have what we call the hold file, and we let those candidates know you're, you're not quite the right fit today, but we will keep your, your file um, um, on hold. And we, what we do is I encourage them to create um, on their career, on the portal um, um, and the, uh, where they can get a notification and that they should keep checking back. And by also being on LinkedIn, I push out all of my new job postings so that they can see, also see that flagged immediately. Um, but I also do uh, referrals to other companies and I have a, an internal networking where I can also give them referrals. And I also encourage them to come out and network with me and help them in the community when we do face-to-face -face networking. Because a lot of the candidates, they're very uncomfortable with those first initial meetings. So I help in any way that I can for that. So, you know, even if you're applying for a job at a particular company, you've gone through the interview process, and you've decided that this is not going to be a good fit with you for you, still go through the entire process. One, because it's going to give you expert uh, experience as far as interviewing, answering difficult questions, because we're not all really great at interviewing. And the more that we can practice that, the better. But then once you hear that you're not accepted for a position, don't go you know, and, and get mad at the recruiter. It just wasn't a right fit. Send them a thank you note, thank you, know, please consider me for the future. And then as I said earlier, if you really enjoy talking with them, if you really enjoyed the process, enjoyed the company, keep up to date with them. Every six months, just check in with them, either on social media or just sending them a quick email. I just wanted to make sure that, you know, you know that I'm still interested. I just finished a new certification. That's part of your responsibility in career search, is to be reaching out and cultivating recruiters to help them find you when they have the right opportunity for you. So what's interesting is that resumes are a part of this overall process. So we wanted to get into a little bit more about you know, resumes. There are lots of studies out there that says you know, a recruiter is going to look at your resume for maybe seven seconds. So I wanted each one of our recruiters sort of talk about how does someone stand out for you on a resume and what are some of the big mistakes. I'm going to start with KJ and then we'll go the, the reverse direction. Um, how does it stand out for me? Um, 
I guess uh, a well-organized resume with your clearance at the top really stands out for me because those are so few and far between. <laughs> um, but um, what, was, what was the rest of that question? So, I just had to think about what stands out, I suppose. But. So what stands out, you know, a lot of times, I mean, how is someone going to grab your attention other than being organized? Um, what does, is there some key information that people tend to bury in their resume that you end up having to look for? Um, yes, I think, well, we, so again, we hire a lot of um, engineers, uh, cyber engineers, we're cyber centric, and so, um, what, what would be great to see is um, your certifications. And again, um, I, know, I know a lot of the transitioning folks, um, they're, they're coached to not put your, um, your, um, your clearance on there. But if, if you're applying for a job that you, a security clearance is required, um, you'll get called back a lot quicker if you put your clearance on there. Um, so, um, Clearance and um, also um, certifications are really key, and um, not so much um, details in the work history, but whatever is germane to the actual position that you're applying to is really key. So uh, even if it's just acronyms. Uh, mm -hmm. So when I review these resumes, I am not a seven second person. I scan at least a minute to two minutes initially on every resume that comes to my career portal or that is emailed to me directly. I am the eyes to everything for my guys. So I'm scanning and then if it hits the major points, I actually download it to my desktop and then I highlight everything for my guys. That's how you get into the front of my guys um, because I have key guys and then my, also my hiring manager. So if you make it past me, then you'll either get, a, they'll, they'll, then they review it and then we have our own little process. And then that's how you get a telecon or a face-to-face, -face, nine times out of 10. Irma, you, you've managed many different hats. What uh, are some of the things? Yeah, um, so, so for me, um, I would say, uh, you know, a, a, a clean resume that's not very cluttered, um, number one, that kind of hits the high points. Um, I agree that I'd like to see maybe at the top an initial profile of X number of years of experience, clearance um, status or level, uh, certifications. Um, and then um, the other thing is when it comes to work history or professional um, history, I think what happens sometimes is candidates, they will copy and paste what their job description is today and just put it on the resume. And um, that kind of makes a long resume and that's when managers kind of start sometimes or recruiters will start kind of getting, you know, losing a little bit of interest there because, um, you know, what you're doing today at the company that you are working at today may kind of be different from how we do things. So try to just kind of hit the high level points of what position you're applying for. If the position is, re you know, requiring a unique kind of skill set uh, or a certain operating system, or something to that effect, mention that in the resume, but don't give me your full job description of the job that you're in today, um, is basically what I would say. I, so, I, I mean, if I could have it, it you know, it'd be brief profile, you know, X number of years of experience, uh, certifications, clearance, and then we can kind of deal with the job history, uh, you know, at the tail end but not too much detail about every single little thing that you do in your job right now. So one thing that I've seen as an interesting trend, specifically in the tech community, is what's called the tech skills certifications grid. So a lot of people will put this big grid at the top part of their resume that says, I have a C plus and an A plus and a security plus, and it's in this either uh, Microsoft table or some kind of table. Please don't do that. I mean, it's, it's really interesting, but when it gets scanned into any of these applicant tracking systems, you have absolutely no idea what's going to, that computer scanning software is going to do to it. So it's also very hard to read when it ends up being scanned and you don't know what kind of computer program or computer the person is going to be reviewing it on. Sometimes 
the recruiter is going to be reviewing this on their phone and they're not going to be able to see all of those different skills in there. So Bill, you seem to be the resume expert. So what are some of the things people should and should not do on their resume? So I actually wrote a guide called The Six Second Resume. Yep. Um, and I am a six second resume kind of a guy. Um, we just can't hire you um, unless you have the, the check boxes like clearance and certification and sometimes education. So we, we always want to see those up front because if we don't see those, maybe we won't see them if they're buried. Um, so I'm, I'm agreeing with, with these two. I'd say one of the, the big mistakes that some people will make is they have this section right up, up at the top that's very subjective. So if you have results-oriented, team player, dedicated, dynamic, great communication skills, I, I've just, I, I, I don't do it intentionally, but I don't even read it. I so it's just that. a waste, waste of space. <laughs> so like what Irma was saying, you wanna have concrete things. Like I'm a cybersecurity professional with 20 years of experience, top secret clearance, and these are my core, pen, I'm, I'm very strong in pen testing. Those sorts of things, like those maybe three key buzzwords, that ought to be your summary section. I tell people, if the rest of your resume burned up and all I saw was that summary section, I wanna see enough there that I wanna pick up the phone and call you. Um, and then, just, just to say some of the other things in my own words, you want your resume to tell a story. So I was doing a resume for a guy earlier this morning and he had a bullet set up access points on his resume and I said, well, what, what does that look like? And he said, well, by myself, I set up 56 access points around the campus. So I'm like, that sounds like a better bullet than just set up access points. So he's using numbers and he's talking about how he was the only one, he wasn't part of a team. So as a recruiter, I'm kind of getting a picture of this guy, the scope of what he's able to handle by himself, which is way better than set up access points. So you can imagine, all the different things that he does that he could make more uh, unique to him by adding numbers, making it sound like an accomplishment, and not just, I showed up to work and didn't get fired. You want to present your business value. You know, what is the value? What are the accomplishments that you're going to be able to bring to that company? Also realize that, you know, thanks to Google, if it, everything is going to be based on keywords match. So if you're looking at a job description and you're sending in your resume and it doesn't have the keywords that are in that job posting, there's not going to be a match. You're not going to come up higher in the search when the recruiter is <coughs> doing the search. So making sure that you've done your due diligence on looking at the job posting and making sure that you have those same keywords in your resume. Please don't do what a lot of people are doing now, which is putting the keywords that are in the job description but may not be in your resume in white font on <laughs> your resume so it comes up because it does highlight. And so the highlight will show that you decided to hack the system. Now, some recruiters might like that, some recruiters may not, but realize you take the chance if you do that. Also realize that when a recruiter is looking at a resume, more often than not, they're looking at it through a preview pane. So they're only looking at the top two inches of your resume. If you have taken that time, uh, that space, to put in your address and put in stuff in large font and italics and bold and lines and stuff like that, you have totally wasted that two inches of space. They're going to want to get that top information. They don't care about all the fancy stuff. Give them the meat right there at the top. A lot of people don't understand that the resume is to get the phone call. It is not to get the job. It is to tease. It's to get that interest going. A lot of people feel that they need to put this, you know, I've got 25 years experience. I need to have this seven page resume. It's not getting you the job. It is getting their interest to call you. So be sure you're looking at your resume from that standpoint. And also realize that you don't have just one resume fits all. You have to make sure that whenever you're applying for a different job, you are taking your skills that best apply to that job and focusing that on your resume. So we've mentioned social media just a little bit. Let's sort of touch about how you network with candidates on social media. I know KJ, you've talked about it a little bit, but Bill, what do you do as far as social media and what do you recommend candidates do on social media? Um, so I'm a 
I'm a big LinkedIn user, although admittedly I don't I don't do a lot of correspondence with candidates through LinkedIn. I mostly do it through phone and email. Um, but I, I always like to check people out on LinkedIn just to see if their LinkedIn profile says something different. I actually like to check people out on Facebook just because I've seen some people that I definitely don't want to hire after <laughs> seeing them on Facebook. Um, that's really the extent of how I use those platforms. Um, I use LinkedIn more than I would Facebook, uh, and I don't even have a Twitter account. Um, we'll get you there. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I printed out my pass to, to get here today. Um, I actually have an IT recruiter that works for me now. We hired him less than a year ago, and so he kind of does a lot more of that than I do. Um, so, I mean, again, I, I mean, I have a LinkedIn account. You want to connect with me, I'll connect with you. You get to see who I'm connected with. Uh, you know, people do message me through LinkedIn, um, and it's, it's just part of the, the networking, like, hey, we met at these sides, and, you know, I want to stay in touch with you, or they'll, you know, we went to a recruiting event. I met you at this table recruiting event, that kind of stuff. But I don't do a whole lot of social media. Um, I'm more of a telephone, email kind of person. And that's, and I'll let KJ talk to this as well, but one thing you have to realize is that you're never going to know how to truly connect with the recruiter who is responsible for that first phone call. A job posting isn't going to say the best way to reach the person to make this connection is fax, snail mail, phone, that. So it is your responsibility to make sure that you have a network so that you can actually get to the decision maker so that you can understand the process more. So KJ, what do you do on social media? You do a lot. Well, I, I'm all over LinkedIn because I, I find that's like the professional mm -hmm. you know, medium. Um, and um, Other than the cat memes. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I don't see a lot of cat memes on there, but um, I just like it because, you know, you've got your, your job postings and then, you know, your, uh, your job fairs. It's just a great way to, to connect with folks. And I, and I do find it's, it's, it, it's kind of the new business card, um, transitioning folks and then they don't have the business card. They, they, it's a great way to promote yourself if, as, as that job seeker, that job candidate. You put your picture out there, you put your resume up there. Um, it's a great icebreaker in many ways. It helps them create confidence for themselves. Um, you guys do, I think you host uh, free LinkedIn pictures a lot of times. Um, it's just a great way to really um, encourage candidates and there's just so many ways that you can, that you can just slice it. So I, I love it, um, but you know, that's just me. Everybody's got their own way. But everyone has, if, if I can just finish this thought and then we can go to the question. So one thing I always recommend when you've established um, a LinkedIn profile is that you can customize your, your URL for your LinkedIn profile. So instead of it being LinkedIn at 65 different characters, you can have, you know, mine is uh, LinkedIn at, you know, Kathleen E. Smith. And I, had, I recommend having that on a business card so that when you're at a networking event, you can say, hey, you know, let's just connect on LinkedIn. Because you're not going to have your resume in your back pocket. You're not necessarily going to want to get your cell phone number out to everyone or you, your email address. It's a nice sort of interface to be out there. And also realize that all of us resonate very differently with different social media. So some people, I know a lot of recruiters who are much more comfortable and much more prolific on Facebook than they are on LinkedIn. And specifically in the tech community, I see a lot more people doing um, recruiting on Twitter than they do on LinkedIn or Facebook. But it's also where you feel most comfortable establishing the relationship. Sir? So are you like one of the recruiters that contacts people to like connect? because I've got a job in San Antonio and I'd really like to talk to you or? I don't really recruit, uh, I don't reach out to people on LinkedIn, like I don't go to your profile and recruit you on LinkedIn. I kind of draw the line there. I don't solicit, I don't do a lot of unsolicited, like I don't hit you up on your LinkedIn profile. I don't do that. Okay. Uh, what I do is I post job, I do my po job posting there. I don't come knock on your door necessarily, but I push my job postings and I create my 
job advertisements, and then if you find me that way, I will come and find you at a networking event, and I'm very low-key about it. Um, I don't have hundreds of jobs that I'm trying to fill. I'd be a lot more aggressive if I did, um, but I don't, and so, um, uh, but I do have a lot of people that come to me on LinkedIn and knock on my door because of the outward marketing that I'm doing. So I don't have a need to do that. But I meet people at job fairs all the time, and when I do, or I meet them in a networking, I say, hey, connect with me on LinkedIn, and you can find, you see it on my feed all the time when you connect <coughs> with me about all the different jobs that I have. So I'm just one of those types of a recruiter. But I do know recruiters do. They'll, they'll ding you and they'll say, connect with me, or they'll send you an, in I don't even have IM, the instant messaging mm -hmm. or whatever it's called. So I can't really, unless you connect, unless I connect with you, I can't really send you messages. So I don't so do that. So are you a stalker, Bill? Yeah, I mean, I headhunt. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I, know, I, I won't. Like I won't that. use it for um, like lower level positions. But if it's a senior level position or specialty skill set, I think LinkedIn is probably one of the best ways to find those people. Now, there there are recruiters out there um, there that use LinkedIn to specifically, you know, cut and paste. I mean, a, a version of. Uh, that will happen. You'll get a lot of messages from people that say, you know, I've got a hot job for you and you'll want to take this right away. That's the first indication that you don't want to, you know, connect with that person. We actually have on B Sites Las Vegas, uh, there was a presentation, you know, sort of the telltale signs of a bad recruiter reaching out to you. What are the things they'll do? And some of the things are, you know, that they'll use LinkedIn to do a lot of spamming. But also realize that there are many different levels of recruiters out there. You've got the recruiters that are direct recruiters. You have staffing firms. You have headhunters. You have executive recruiters. You have call shops that are based out of you know India or something like that. That is going to happen in any industry. I mean, as KJ said, if you if you're someone who's active on LinkedIn, I can't tell you how many people have reached out to me who are the front people for a business development firm, marketing agency, finance, real estate, Roden and Fields, cosmetics. I mean, I get all of the kinds. And I also go and get a lot of people reaching out to me that have very, very obviously fake accounts. So yeah, it's going to happen. It's going to be out there. It's part of social media. There's good parts and there's bad parts. So in our last few minutes, um, you've got the job. It's great. You finally made it through the process. What about the first few months of a new job? What are some of the things, because this is the one thing that people really don't think about. You put all that work into finding a job. You put all that work into making it through all the tests and the interviews, and then all of a sudden you're there at the first job, and there are some things that people don't think about. So, Irma? Um, well, that's an interesting question. Um, for, for us, I guess, the first six months, I would say our new hires are still learning. Um, you know, they're learning the contract, they're learning the job. I mean, they can come in seasoned or skilled, but at the end of the day, we have a unique contract. Um, each one has its different, I guess, you know, way of handling things or maybe a slightly different culture or the skill set's different. So for me, I think, you know, our employees are still busy learning the first six months. Um, and we have like an education reimbursement program at our company and you have to be with the company for six months before you can participate in it. And then the next step I would say is start talking and having a, a conversation, not even at the six month mark, but you know, before you get there, about any additional development opportunities, uh, certifications that you might you know, be interested in pursuing to kind of help prepare you for next level. Personally, I can tell you for, for IP Secure, our philosophy is that when we hire someone, we would like for them to stay in that job at least one year. Um, because again, our hiring managers are investing a lot of time in getting that employee uh, on you know board and acclimated to the contract so um, if you're coming on as a new hire and you know three months into the job you're already looking for a promotion opportunity uh, that might not be the right fit for us 
And sometimes we we kind of we interview for something like that as part of the interview process. You know, we'll ask a little bit about what the the career goals or aspirations are, and and sometimes if we get that response where you know I I want to be in a different position, you know, in six months or in a year, that kind of is a red flag for us. Bill, what are some of the new kid on the block kind of things to? Tips. Yeah, I, I agree with everything she said and would say that again. Um, I would also add, maybe find a mentor. Like hopefully you're not taking a job uh, just because you can do everything that's in the job. Hopefully you're taking a job because it's going to expose you to new things that you haven't done before. So find someone that knows those things and say, hey, will you teach me how to do this function so I can be really good at it? And Show me what, what's it like to work for this boss, you know. Find somebody that can help you navigate the, the culture as well. JJ? Uh, when we onboard a new employee, we usually team them with someone on the program that is obviously experienced and, and um, but we, we try to also, you know, we partner them with someone that they're gonna be compatible with so that um, it makes a smooth transition. Um, uh, so, uh, but, uh, personally, I, I like to recommend that usually within the first 90 days that um, you get to know everyone and that you make it a point to uh, learn their names and that you also review your job description and you review it with your, um, your manager, your immediate manager, and so that you're really clear on the expectations. Um, so it's one thing that you know, you've got the job, but you really take time to go over that job description again but you make a point to sit down with them and, and you address the expectations so that you're clear on it. Because sometimes, you know, it's a whirlwind to go through that process. And sometimes the hiring manager is not necessarily the manager. And you might not have met that manager. But, um, and, and the onus is really on you to um, take that time. The manager will get with you, but sometimes um, you have your expectations and so does that manager. And it speaks well of you to take that leadership um, that leadership role and, and, and have that meeting. So sometimes uh, they'll get with you, but um, to, to have those things in line and let them know what, what you expect too as well, because you'll have your own expectations. So. We have one minute left. Um, anyone have a question? Because I'm sure the panelists so will take questions afterwards, but does anyone have one question that they would like to ask? Yeah, yes, ma'am. Well, I'm on the, I build teams and recently was at Apple and did a lot of hiring there. And the one thing that I keep hearing is you put a lot of stock in certifications. I have found over 10, 15 years that the more certifications, certifications everyone has, the least qualified they are for these jobs. They, they spend so much time testing and they're very good at testing and getting certifications, but working in the real world, I find that I'm hiring the people that don't have the certifications, that have a drive and, and they tell me, you know, I'll ask them, why don't you have whatever certification? So my, per again, this is my personal, you know, thought or opinion, but when I see a resume and there's 10 different certifications tied to it, it's a red flag for me sometimes because I wonder if this individual is just really good at studying and taking exams and getting certs, but then how are, how are they gonna perform in the real world? So we, we do put a lot of stock into certifications only because in, in my case, my customer, which is the Department of Defense, requires them. Mm -hmm. You know, there are a lot of great qualified people out there that I wish, you know, we could move forward with. And, you know, the one thing I can say is, you know, depending on the job, a minimum of a CompTIA Security Plus, you know, should be able to help, help you get that baseline certification to qualify for, you know, some, most jobs at my company. I can't speak on behalf of anybody else. But, um, I mean, I, I agree with you. Um, we are required just because it's part of the, the, uh, the contract that we have with the government that these certifications are necessary for someone to perform the job. Do I necessarily believe that? No. It's just a box that you need to check off. 
Um, but I, when I do see a lot of people with tons of certs, I kind of wonder a little bit about and, and some of the things that we talked about in the earlier sessions is realize that it is sort of a balance between having the education degrees, having the certifications, but also having the experience. And understanding that you can get that experience through competitions, you can get that through having a home lab, you can get that through being on open source projects. But you know, those are things that you not only have to do on your own, you also have to journal and make sure that you're able to present that to a recruiter or to a hiring manager. What are you doing on your home lab? What open source projects did you do? If you went through a competition, what was the challenge that you overtook and what were some of the skills you learned? So we actually have run over. I've been told that I have to keep on a time schedule. Let's thank our panelists for being here this morning. And um, that's it. I think we have another session coming in here at 12, but uh, Bill is available for resume review in conference room C. And, and career I, coaching. And career coaching. Because I know half of you didn't bring your resumes. So, <laughs> so come talk to me about your jobs.